Um, okay, so we're now live. Uh, hello, everybody. We're now live. We're streaming on Twitter, Facebook, uh, and directly on Labelist. And I have Jeremy Miles with me. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, Luke. How are you? Yeah, not bad, not bad. So this is one of our in conversation with events. We started uh, these introducing shadow cabinet members to Labourist readers and Labour members so that people can see where they're coming from in terms of their policy brief. Um, and we're now talking to a member of our Welsh Labour government, which is carrying out Labour policies as we speak. So um, there's lots of big things to talk about. Brexit uh, with the deal having just been enforced, obviously. Devolution is front and centre at the moment. Um, and we have the Senate elections coming up later this year. And so we think it's a really good idea for everyone who's supportive of Labour and who reads Labour lists just to get better acquainted with the members um, sort of carrying out Labour policy. So if you've got any questions for Jeremy during the course of the interview, please do post them on YouTube, Twitter or Facebook or DM me on Twitter so I can put those uh, questions to Jeremy when we have our um, Q&A session at the end from readers. So, uh, Jeremy, you are the Council General for the Welsh Government and the Minister for European Transition. Um, now, that last role has probably had a pretty big workload over the past year. Um, and now the transition period has ended. The UK and the EU struck a deal that's been implemented. Um, so, having been the trans Transition Minister since December 2018, um, I guess it's interesting to know what are the biggest challenges been there in terms of dealing with a changing Tory administration so what was it like dealing with a Boris Johnson government compared to Theresa May's government and, and how did that kind of relationship work? Well I mean you know the Theresa May uh, days were definitely not uh, you know the sunny uplands of, uh, of, of uh, intergovernmental working uh, but mm. they were definitely better than uh, the Johnson era if I can put it like that and there was definitely a marked shift you know, between the two governments in terms of how they dealt with uh, the devolved government. You know, I think in the Theresa May years, there was generally at least an attempt to try and um, engage us in some in some things, but, but, you know, that was sort of dried up completely, really, um, due when Boris Johnson became Prime Minister. I guess from, from my point of view, one of the, you know, the kind of hallmark of the last, uh, you know, couple of years, really, has been one of, you know, immense frustration, really, um, trying as a government, as a Welsh Labour government, to try and, uh, you know, shape some of the approaches the UK government was taking, where they affected devolved things, devolved areas, um, and really trying to be, frankly, you know, despite the huge political differences between us and the fact that, you know, as a government, we didn't want uh, the UK to leave the EU, um, you know, despite that, we've been pretty pr kind of constructive, really, I would say, pretty creative, pretty... Um, pragmatic in trying to work with them, and there was really, you know, frankly, that uh, didn't, uh, you know, didn't didn't work basically. Mm -hmm. So just really frustrating. And I think, you know, seeing seeing the way the negotiation played out as well, um, it was pretty inept, quite honestly. Yeah. Um, you know, just you know, a belief that the, the EU would basically cave in, and obviously that was never going to happen. So I think the UK government really sold the UK short by being so, you know, blinkered in its negotiation, really. Mm. And obviously, as well on that, you know, you're working with UK Labour too to sort of on an issue like that. So, um, Keir Starmer whipping MPs to vote for Johnson's Brexit deal. What did you think of that? Did you approve of that approach that he took at that point? Well, look, I mean, you know, fr frankly, there's no prospect uh, of voting against it. I think, you know, I think, um, uh, and it's for colleagues in Parliament to make their own judgments on that. Certainly, from our point of view in the Senate, um, you know, we were in a position. Uh, where that sort of vote was needed, obviously, but we had a debate anyway um, for people, you know, to express our views on the deal, and we were really clear the deal was a you know terrible deal, but obviously better than the alternative of having no deal, which would have been frankly, you know, irresponsibly chaotic, really. So, um, you know, I think one of the key things really is you know the way that the Johnson government handled the whole thing at any stage, really, it's kind of tried to exclude. You know, Parliament and the devolved governments and devolved legislatures from the process. Mm -hmm. Really, make, I, I would say making a complete mockery of both the parliamentary process and, in our case, uh, the process in the Senate and you know, the devolved uh, you know, nations as well. So you know, it's, it's, it's by any measure you know, the most significant um, you know, piece of constitutional and international um, relations legislation we've passed, obviously, you know, in decades, and for it to be passed through Parliament in the day is actually a scandal, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, incredibly, incredibly quick and unprecedented as well. Yeah. yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, on the sort of 
on the specifics of the Brexit deal and what that means yeah. for work people then I guess we've heard you know we've heard lots of stories in the media of sort of disruption since January 1st um I saw the other day your colleague the environment minister recently warned of the catastrophic impact of the deal on the seafood industry for example which is worth 13.3 million pounds to the Welsh economy so so what have you seen of the kind of practical implications the, the stories um the kind of issues that you're dealing with um as a transition minister well, like, so the big picture is obviously with seven days to go to the end of the transition period, you know, clearly that was just chaotic, really, to leave it that late, obviously. So mm. you know, it all stems from that, or at least much of it stems from that. Businesses really not getting, not in a position, frankly, to be able to be ready. I and mean, you can't blame businesses about this. They've spent the whole of the last year trying to manage the pressures of COVID. So we would sort of talk to them and say, well, these changes are on the way, you know, prepare for them and the next question was obviously so what is it exactly we're preparing for and you know you couldn't describe that until a week before so you can't blame businesses they were frankly under the cost from all sorts of different um, directions really but there's some you know some really specific challenges now in Wales so you mentioned the uh, fishery sector obviously a huge concern there um, you know we've also got concerns in relation to our ports um, on the western seaboard because you know, we as a government put loads of plans in place to manage disruption around the port which is our devolved responsibility and those plans have worked fine but what we have seen you know we expected there to be lower traffic at lower freight levels this time of year anyway you know partly because of covid partly because of stockpiling for christmas and all of that but actually the freight levels have gone down quite significantly they're starting to go back up but there are no direct freight routes as you know from um from northern ireland uh, to the mainland, uh, to the main, European mainland. So, you know, that is a, is a really big concern for us. The UK government, they've dismissed it really as teething trouble, which is, you know, just completely irresponsible, really. We want to make sure the land bridge is, you know, an attractive option for, for freight coming from uh, any part of Ireland through Wales, obviously. So we're working hard on that, but that's a significant issue. Loads of small exporters and supply chain companies into export companies saying to us they don't understand the new kind of rules of origin requirements, you know, when they get products from other parts of the world and they incorporate that in their foodstuffs or their products. What does that mean for them? How do they document all of that? How do they report it? You know, it sounds, sounds dull, doesn't it? But it's a huge kind of administrative burden and therefore huge cost. Companies in the pharma sector really anxious about now having to have their um, you know, batches conformed and assessed in different ways, adding time, adding cost to the process. Um, farmers concerned about uh, agricultural funding in the future. UK government actually cut by about 147 million the money that was meant to come into the Welsh agricultural sector this year to replace the common agricultural policy. So that's a massive cut. So farmers really anxious about that. So, you know, there's a range. Uh, range of concerns which are you know very practical very real world concerns and you know we're just three weeks in that we as we get further into the year obviously more of it's going to emerge i'm afraid um as you said you're three weeks in at the moment so what you know what are the conversations you're having with the government what are you asking for specifically in terms of support and, and things to change because as you say it's across the board um yeah well we have you know we have a we have intergovernmental meetings sort of, you know, three or four times a week, actually. So there's a sort of rhythm of that kind of engagement. Much of it is around how do we make things work at the ports? How do we work together to make sure we solve those challenges? We've also been asking for support for the fishery sector. We've been calling for sort of a broader economic um, package, which look, looks at both COVID and uh, the Brexit adjustment. Because, you know, for some businesses, frankly, as a result of the deal, um, you know, maybe their business model entirely isn't, isn't viable anymore, but others need a bit of support to get into a sort of new way of working. So but there needs to be a UK wide uh, you know, support package for that. There's no question about that. really. So those sorts of things as well. Um, mm. you know, frankly, through much of last year, it was quite it was like pulling teeth to get the Tories to engage with us on a lot of these big issues. And, you know, as we got near the deadline, obviously, people got more anxious. And so there was better better job working really but it was really tough going to get them to engage properly yeah of course um and i i know that um well first minister when he uh look, responded to the brexit deal first of all he, he described it as a thin deal but he also said it provides a platform to which we can return to argue for benefits um sorry for improvements in the future um so what what plans are there to improve on the deal as it is and you know how how would that work and what might any of the improvements actually be 
Well, look, the first task is you know making sure businesses, organisations, individuals, and so on in Wales understand what the current deal is and, and you know help them adjust to that new reality. So that's definitely our our top priority in in the short term. But you know the point of what the first minister was saying was it's obviously a poor deal, but it's clearly better to maintain a relationship that you can try and improve on. So if we'd left with no deal at all, you know we've got nothing to build on bluntly. And clearly no appetite to start engaging on creating a new deal after we'd left. I mean, there's just the politics of that just were never going to happen, really. So that's that's what we mean by that. There's a kind of platform to build on. But, you know, there's a sort of, you know, there's a sort of reality check for all of us. There's no, there's no expectation, it seems to me, uh, probably on the EU side as much as the UK government side, getting back around negotiating table. Um, but, you know, we are very, we are absolutely uh, clear as a government in Wales we're going to do everything we can within our you know, powers and resources to work with businesses and so on to help them through this as best we can. Um, we're going to be publishing a bit of an analysis of that in the next um, two or three weeks, I hope, which will be a bit of a guide for everyone in Wales about what the deal means for them, really. Um, yeah. And then, you know, there's some things which obviously will need to be negotiated again, and we are going to have a set of asks around that when the time comes. And, um, I mean, the, the deal is set to be reviewed in four years' time, isn't it? So, uh, you know, at this point, um, Downing Street has said that it could revert to the Australian-style relationship, which they kept talking about last year, which, of course, basically means no deal. Yeah. Um, so, it, I mean, it's, it's not by any means job done, is it? I mean, that no deal prospect could still be there. I mean, we cannot be in that situation, can we? And I, I'm very much hopeful. And the time the review period comes, it won't be a Tory government that's doing the review for us, obviously. I hope that will be... Um, we have Keir Starmer in, in Downing Street by then. So, uh, look, we, we cannot be in a situation where we're talking about turning the clock back from this deal. I mean, it's frankly barely a deal at all. Um, and, you know, we've seen already in the last few weeks, even people, even businesses who, you know, where the owners voted to leave and now saying, gosh, well, was this the right thing to do? That's just going to get, that is just going to get more intensive in the coming months and years, I think. And, you know, we're going to have to find a situation, have to find a scenario in which we kind of build better relationships but there's a real challenge i think for those of us who are pro-european i think there's a sort of you know there's a task here we found ourselves in the referendum the wrong side of a debate you know of public opinion as it were um mm. i think because we didn't you know we took the we took the eu for granted really for decades frankly we didn't make the case strongly enough for the kind of relationship and its benefits so the task for us at this point is to think about how we try and build that consensus across the uk um, over the next, you know, however many years and decades. Yeah. Um, and last time I spoke to you, uh, so I spoke to you last last September, um, we spoke about the Internal Market Bill, which is now the Internal Market Act, mm -hmm. which ostensibly deals with the functioning of the internal UK market. Now we've left the EU, um, but it's been described as a power grab from Westminster. Um, and the Welsh Government has now levelled a legal challenge at the UK Government over the bill, uh, which you've described as a fundamental challenge to the Senate um, and other devolved administrations. So that's, I mean, that's quite an unusual move, isn't it? I mean, could you tell us a little bit about that legal challenge, um, why it's been brought and what, what you're seeking to achieve with that? Sure. Well, it's a bit technical, so I'll try and keep it non-technical, really. But, you know, basically the Act is a constitutional overhaul masquerading as, as, as market regulation, really. You know, there's no two ways about it. Um, but, you know, we we tried to get the bill uh, amended with some success. We worked with the Lords to try and get it uh, amended. And we did get a number of things um, improved in the bill. So that's really, you know, the, yeah, that really is the credit to the Lords for their work uh, on that. Um, we also recommended the Senate should not consent to the bill, which they didn't. And I guess the third arm to that is, is this legal challenge, really. So we've just launched proceedings last week. Um, essentially, you know, it's obviously very unusual to challenge a parliamentary bill once it becomes an act, but it is not, you know, but it does happen. Um, and the principles we're using to challenge it are pretty well established legal principles. But obviously it's a kind of, you know, it's a, it's a new, it's a new kind of challenge, clearly. What we want for the, is for the court to say that the ways in which the bill, um, you know, affects the devolution settlement, um, uh, that the bill can't be used to undermine the devolution settlement, basically. So it's all it's quite technical, but um, if you're going to repeal or amend a constitutional statute, like the devolution statutes, you've got to do that expressly. And our argument is that this act just does it um, effectively behind the, tries to do it effectively behind the scenes. And the impact on the devolution settlement is really extensive. Um, so, you know, if we want to stop some, 
if within our own powers, our own devolved powers in Wales, we want to regulate uh, the quality of uh, foodstuffs or uh, the yeah. kind of packaging you can use. So this act drives a coach and horses through all of that, really. So, you know, if there's a lower standard anywhere else in the UK, England, for example, then the devolved nations would not effectively be able to uh, regulate above that for things being sold in their supermarkets, for example. So it's a major issue, really. Uh, so, yeah, that's why we brought the, brought the challenge. Yeah. And if you're so if the challenge is successful, does that repeal bits of the legislation or, or how does that sort of work uh, in practice? Yeah. So it doesn't repeal any of it, but what it says is you can't interpret, it'll effectively say, it's, the challenge relates to what's known in the bill as the market access principles, which is the mm -hmm. bill that regulates, you know, um, the trade between the four nations of the UK, basically. And what the, if, if we were successful, uh, we would get a declaration from the courts that would say you cannot interpret the Internal Market Act in a way which, you know, cuts back on the devolution settlement, cuts back on the devolved powers of the Senate. So it basically stipulates a way of interpreting the act, basically. So that's what we hope to get. And what, um, I mean, have you had any conversations with Keir Starmer and the leadership, uh, UK Labour leadership on, on, on that? So they know about the challenge, but we talked a lot uh, to the front bench uh, during the passage of the Internal Market Bill. There was really good uh, joint working um, with um, with Ed and Rachel and others about how we were approaching it, what the issues were for us uh, as a devolved government, really, as the, as the only Labour government in the UK at the moment, obviously. Yeah. Um, so we were, that was really good uh, working with them, with colleagues in Parliament around that, which I'm really pleased about. Okay. Yeah. And um, I mean, so we're going to shift on to more sort of devolution stuff. But I think this links in quite well with what you're saying, because obviously the Internal Market Act, um, you know, the whole point of the legal challenge is about the devolution settlement, how it impacts that. So uh, Keir Starmer's talked about in his leadership campaign about um, radical devolution. Uh, and he, at the end of last year, launched the UK wide constitutional commission on devolution. So what conversations have you had with um, or if any, you know, with the UK Labour leadership on on that? Commission? Well, there have been discussions between uh, our First Minister and uh, Keir in relation to that. And I think it's good that, you know, I think the speech was, a set, in a sense, focused on Scotland, wasn't it? Because it was an issue, a set of issues in Scotland which were being explored really in the speech. But but I think it's really good that he's uh, announced a UK wide uh, convention. I think it's really important as a party that we have a very radical offer in this, in this area, really. You know, we've, you know, if we want to um, persuade people who could vote Labour um, in Scotland and who do vote Labour in Wales to, you know, to stay with us as a party and elect, uh, you know, elect Keir into government. We need to be able to meet uh, some of those constitutional concerns that other parts of the UK have. Um, and we, the only way of doing that will be with the most radical uh, offer possible and for us, obviously, to make sure that we win um, uh, the next general election. So, you know, that's, I think, really urgent priority for the for the for the party, you know, we saw on the weekend the polling numbers in the Sunday Times polls, which is I think should be a wake up call really for us all. Um, so I think you know this issue is going to be I think one of the dominant issues of the next uh, of, of the next decade for us all. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I know you gave a speech last week and you talked about federalist principles um, and you've talked about the document, uh, you talked about the document reforming our union published by the Welsh government in 2019. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask, you know, what does uh, that, uh, you know, federalist principles in, in practice mean to you and what would that kind of look like? Well, reforming our union was a sort of a document we did, we published a couple of years ago with the government to you know, bring to, to a head really a debate about what we needed to do in light of Brexit, really, to reform the constitution. Um, and it's, it's a contribution to a debate. There's been quite a lot of other kind of contributions in Wales in the last, you know, since then, really, including most recently, a couple of weeks ago, um, a small group of Labour um, members and members of the Senate published a thing called uh, We the People, uh, which is about a, a radical federalist approach, which really is about, you know, making sure that we have um, a constitutional settlement across the UK, which also, in the way they were describing it, involves English regions having um, significant devolution as well look i think the, i think the two main things I'm, I'm myself um i'm not especially kind of you know theological about what the kind of particular mechanics are mm -hmm. i think the two key principles that we need to you know be able to get us get a consensus around is firstly that you know you can't do any of this 
if we still have this idea of Parliament being totally sovereign. So there needs to be some way of, of, of Parliament you know, giving up its powers to the nations and the regions of the UK. So in whatever form that takes, I think that's you know, one of the big building blocks. And the second big building block, I think, is around making sure that there's a sort of enforceable mechanism for um, for us to redistribute wealth across the UK. So we've got a very, you know, very inadequate formula at the moment, which is very much in the control of um, of, of the Conservative government in Westminster at the moment. Um, mm. Something which is much more stable and um, not just benefits Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, but also benefits those parts of England which are really massively shortchanged by you know the over centralization of the economy in England so you you just thought there's a consensus which could be built around that across the UK including in England actually which I think is absolutely you know absolutely essential yeah I mean we've had we've had a lot of calls in the last year even um for a new constitutional settlement um and you know most recently Gordon Brown warned didn't he that the, without it the UK risks becoming a failed state um yeah. and you say with the launch of we the people which calls for a socialist alternative beyond the current choice of least bad options on the evolution so these are coming from across the labor movement and across the spectrum of the labor party so yeah. you know how are we going to bring these ideas together and and especially i think when you know when things develop down the road a little bit and we've got more specific ideas coming forward how, how are we going to sort of build agreement and make sure that we still have that agreement on on sort of the radical change that's needed well this has happened before successfully by the way so um the, the probably the best example of this uh i would say is the scottish constitutional convention between um you know the late 80s and the late 90s which led to the devolution you know to the early blair years uh, in terms of the devolution settlements there and that was that that actually was a cross-party civic society uh based uh convention which i think is a, is a good approach personally but even if you're doing it within the party i think you know there is a range of uh, this i think the debate within the party um you know is in a sense you know in its early stages really now if you're the Labour party in wales or in scotland obviously you know because of the evolution settlement we are much more kind of used to having these discussions on a pretty continuous basis because you know you're talking about your different relationships across the uk you know for obvious reason that less part of the mainstream um of the uk labor party discussion i would suggest certainly the part as it relates to england so you know the convention is a real opportunity to get some of these creative ideas into the mainstream of the party's thinking, um, uh, you know, but we need to do that quickly, really. So, and for me, you know, I think there's a sort of um, it, we've got to be we've got to ask the right questions of ourselves, really. So you can start this discussion by asking, um, you know, how do we save the union? Actually, for a lot of the people that we want to persuade to support us, that is no longer the question. <laughs> the question is, you know. What kind of future do we want, and why is the union an indispensable part of that? So, so that's the argument that we need to make and win as a party across the UK. I think, um, you know, we want we want uh, a, you know a UK which is about you know fair fair um, fair distribution, mutual support, uh, the core Labour values which you know no other parties can offer in the UK. And what is it about the union that delivers that for all parts of the UK? And that's the question we need to answer for people really i think for an awful lot of people it's the question how do we save the union just doesn't resonate really so um but actually the good thing for us i i think as a party we are the only party that's capable of making sure the uk doesn't split apart because you know in a sense i think the conservatives have sort of given up on it despite what we saw in, in the sunday times i think you know the sorts of things you see talked about there just show how far away the tories are from grappling with the scale of the issue, really. The notion you can just draw up the drawbridge um, and, uh, and hope for the best and fly a few Union Jacks is really not going to cut the ice at all, really. There needs to be a much kind of better engagement uh, with the nations of the UK uh, to make the Union work in the future. The thing for us as a party is we've got two principles which I think put us, you know, give us, give us a, a, an advantage. One is that commitment to mutual support across, you know, across all... The nations and regions of the UK, and that's you know, not a conservative principle; it's a Labour principle. And the other commitment is a commitment to self-determination. You know, and I think that's also not a conservative commitment. So, you know, with those two principles, I think you know we we are better placed to you know to reform the way the UK works uh, in a way which works for all of it, basically. Hmm. And I mean, yeah, in that sort of 
I mean, it's a conversation that goes beyond parties, you know, even and the, the dividing yeah. draws dividing lines within parties as well. So, I mean, is it possible to get Tory consent on uh, radical devolution? Um, you know, and is that necessary? Is that something we need to do? Well, um, I, I think the best, you know, the, the obvious point to make is the best kind of constitutional reform is the one which commands the kind of you know broadest consensus. But uh, you know, I think the truth of it is. Um, from a Welsh perspective, what we've seen in Wales is, um, uh, you know, pretty a few kind of lone voices in the Conservative Party saying, you know, essentially saying the UK government, the, the, the Conservative government in Westminster is, you know, the, the union will come apart on their watch unless they change course. We've got, you know, Conservative members of the Senate saying that. And all credit to them, really, because it's not easy for them to say that, but it's the reality. Um, so, you know, there's a real issue uh, about the Conservative Party just, you know, giving up on what it needs to do in order to save the union. And I think actually, unless it unless it turns that around very quickly, it'll be too late to persuade, you know, voters in Scotland that they're not better off by being independent. And that would be that would be bad news for all of us, I think. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, I suppose it's obviously a very broad discussion at the moment, um, but it is one that needs to move quickly, uh, like you said. And you know, are there sort of specific policy areas that you think would ideally just be best dealt with in, by the Senate um, as opposed to Westminster? And, and is there any sort of idea in your mind of, of how you divvy up the powers um, at the moment? Yes, well, certainly from my point of view, I'd have the entire justice system devolved. I'd extend more powers over uh, energy. I'd have a better funding settlement, which gave Wales more tax raising power. So there's a whole kind of range of, you know, there's a sort of menu, if you like, of, of additional powers. So that's one way of looking at it. What's, what's yeah. the list of things that you want uh, Wales to have control over? And, you know, we have those debates quite, quite a lot in the Welsh Labour Party. Um, the other way of looking at it, I think, is to say, you know, if you're if you're going to make the argument for the union, which is obviously, um, you know, what we're talking about, you should start from saying what to, you know, what is the maximum um, that can be done at a kind of national and regional level, and what do those nations decide they want to pool centrally, essentially? And you know, I think that's a much better way of approaching it. You know, that's the kind of basic democratic principle of subsidiarity. And then you get things like defence, migration, um, foreign policy, international trade, obviously dealt with at Westminster, but frankly, much much else devolved. You know, and I think that will be a much healthier, uh, much healthier union for us. Yeah. Yeah, and so on on that kind of framing the argument thing you mentioned about saving the union possibly yeah. isn't the best message, and I suppose it, I guess it particularly wouldn't be a good message maybe for younger people. Do you think it splits down in different ways, different demographics? Maybe it is a more appealing thing for an older generation, and um, maybe for younger people less so. So I guess I guess that comes well, that is a very good question because it's about who is your audience for this discussion really, um, and that's you know I think. Um, if you're building your argument on uh, historic achievements of the union, so you know that's a good start because it's a positive set of things to be talking about, isn't it? It's a sort of um, Olympics 2012 version of Britain, really, which you know, which is a kind of you know largely one of achievement and inclusion and internationalism. Um, so you know, that's a positive starting point, but it's not enough because you know we're progressives and we you know we bank progress or we've got when well, we've got progress we move on to the next thing we can achieve together that's the nature of it that's what we want so that's why we've got to have a very future focused uh, way of looking at this what is it that's happening in the next hundred years uh, which is you know which needs the union to be in place for it to happen basically and for us as a party you know that's about you know mutual support essentially um, in a world which is increasingly um, you know um, fractious really so a lot of that is very core labor values i think to the point about a generational difference you know for the first time this year for example in wales 16 and 17 year olds will be voting in the senate elections we've got a whole new cohort um yeah. of people coming through to vote which is fantastic i was actually the minister who um represented the government's interest in taking the bill for the senate so i'm really proud about that um and i think there is a difference actually i speak to you know young people in my own constituency and even people who are labor supporters um, definitely a very open-minded in the question of, you know, what, what the future constitutional setup is, if you like. I know a lot of Labour members who belong to Yes Cymru, which is the pro-independence, um, mm. sort of party, it's a, I guess, a kind of campaign, really. Um, so we've got to speak to those uh, to those individuals. And so, you know, 
we've got to be really mindful as well that a lot of people that we would like to continue to support us are Labour members, uh, Labour voters, you know, Labour values who really want to get a Labour government, vote for it in Wales and get it in the Senev, but don't get it in Westminster, or at least haven't had it often enough in Westminster. So we've got to, I think, identify with that, that a lot of people are wrestling with those two challenges, really. And our task is to persuade them that staying with the Labour Party and reforming the union is the way forward. But, you know, I think... We've got, and that's, that tells you something about the kind of language that we use in talking to people. You know, I think we've got to have, we've got to kind of recognise the dilemma that they face, um, but encourage them not to lose faith that there's a different way of running the union. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, so we, we talked about sort of different um, different themes within devolution, and obviously uh, the the way our sort of um, democratic institution looks. Um, look uh, isn't part of that so um i know that the reforming our union document um which you know obviously it, it has been made a while ago now and you may have developed on from that but but so what uh, i, I notice in it particularly um it says that we need an upper chamber that reflects the multinational character of the union so about laws reform you know how would that be achieved what what could that look like would that be a quota of seats would how would that kind of work and be distributed among the dev devolved um administrations well, I mean, I think there's, you know, there's all, all sorts of ways of doing that. The fundamental point is to move away from having the kind of setup that we have now into one which more, which specifically reflects the geographic differences uh, of the UK, and that can't simply be population based for obvious reasons. Really, that would lead to, you know, effectively an, an imbalance in the second chamber. But I think, you know, I, that's one of the reasons why I was so heartened actually by the. Um, by the experience about the internal market bill um, of working with the Lords, and we did. A lot of work with crossbenchers and part and peers in all parties uh, on the devolution issues, and I was really struck by how focused, you know, an awful lot of them were on how important it was to make sure the devolution aspects were protected. Mm -hmm. um, you know, much much more focused than the UK elected government was, which you know was completely uninterested in truth. And I think that's you know it's encouraging that that support was there, but it's a pretty bleak assessment that you've got the unelected chamber more ready to defend the constitution. Than the government really and i think that tells us something you know i was saying at the start how do you as it were sell this idea of a reformed uk um to you know maybe parts of england where it, evidence suggests there hasn't historically been a huge amount of appetite for you know this kind of reform really um and i think having a parliament which basically isn't subject completely to you know a government who railroad stuff through and is completely disrespectful of it is probably something you could use to sell that kind of different vision of a reform union to different parts of England as well, really. So, you know, I kind of hope, I'm hopeful there's a sort of, you know, a, a consensus you could build around those sorts of principles. Yeah. And do you think, I mean, do you think the COVID pandemic, obviously this, we've been having these discussions over the last nine months in, in the pandemic. So um, do you think that's kind of had a real big effect on the devolution discussions? Uh, I mean, I think it's obviously highlighted some of the tensions between UK government and devolved administrations and local government as well, actually. So do you think that's boosted that sort of drive for a bit of change? Uh, I think it's done a few things. I think my impression is that it's uh, it has raised awareness across the UK um, of different governments doing different things in different circumstances or you know, in their own circumstances really so that is good in terms of people understanding that the uk operates in a different way that's a positive thing i think it's good in terms of media interest and scrutiny um you know we've got there's much more um uh, uk network wide kind of scrutiny of what happens in wales through the welsh government on this issue than obviously anything else and i think that is a good thing it's good for Wales. it's good for the uk within wales it's definitely the case that um, there is a much wider, much better awareness of, you know, frankly, the existence of the Welsh Government, what Welsh Government can do, who the First Minister is, what the First Minister is doing. So all of that is good from a kind of democratic point of view. Um, I think, I hope it'll lead to there being a turnout, an increase in turnout in the um, Senev uh, elections. I think that will be obviously a good thing democratically. But I also think what it has meant is people have understood as well some of the sh short shortcomings of working within this sort of unreformed, you know, yeah. setup really. Um, and, it, you know, it's never been, it's never been um, our uh, plan as a government to, you know, either go out of our way to highlight, um, but definitely not to pretend they don't exist. We want it to be as honest as possible with people in Wales. And I think that 
you know, contributes to people's understanding that there needs to be significant reform, really. Um, you know, for example, so we, we our position as a government is that we want um, the justice system to be uh, devolved to Wales. Yeah. Um, we've made a significant kind of piece of work around that to, to, to sort of highlight how we could how it could happen. And what we've seen over the period of COVID is, you know, really good joint working between Welsh government and the prison service, the probation service, court service, all of those, the police, obviously. Um, really good job working. And you just think, how much better could that all be if there wasn't this kind of jagged edge about one part being devolved, the one part being, you know, reserved to Westminster? It would just be more, you know, much more effective, really, if um, if, if it was all under the aegis of one government, really. Mm. And that on the criminal justice system, on the justice system, sorry, I mean, it's um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because Wales is the only one of devolved areas that doesn't have uh, yeah. its own devolved um, justice system in the same way. And actually sort of in the world as well, it's very rare for that to happen in political systems, I understand. Uh, yes, I mean, what we have, I think it's the only example in the world, as far as we've been able to identify, of... Um, you know, there being a legislature, which the Senate is, which has primary lawmaking powers and doesn't have its own jurisdiction. So it's just mm. it's just a quirk. Well, it's more than a quirk, you know, but it just shows you how kind of irrational in the way constitutional sort of development is in the UK. Really. But it has practical, unfortunately, it has practical consequences in people's lives, really. Um, so we feel, partly for that reason, that devolving justice system would allow us to have a much more kind of rational way of doing it, really. I mean, there's really, you know, there's very, very close job working, obviously, with the police, for example. Um, uh, but, you know, there's much more we could do. We, and um, we had a, a report which um, which was published at the end of 2019, the Thomas Commission. Uh, um, Lord Thomas, who's a former Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, um, who um, chaired it which really makes the case you know, very, very compellingly for devolution of justice to Wales, and also would mean that we could have a much more uh, progressive justice system, you know, which, you know, we are absolutely desperate to be able to put in place, really. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah, so to, going back to just COVID and that kind of link to devolution there as well, I mean, are there any other sort of things you can think of that would have been dealt with much better or, or, or have been really sort of, you know, undermined by the, by the way the devolution settlement is working at the moment um, in the effort to fight COVID? I guess from a devolution point of view, the main uh, issue uh, would be around uh, the justice system. Really. I also just want to say, though, to, just to be clear, you know, there's been, you know, individuals in the justice system have made it work, basically. You know, they've made the kind of jagged edge work um, in the last nine months. So nothing but a tribute to those individuals, really. It's been, you know, it's been fantastic. Just yeah. it's it's frustrating in the sense about how much more you could do if it was devolved. So that's really my my take on it. I guess what it's also shown though is you know we've got a set of um, structures which for which you know where the governments work together across the UK, uh, and those structures weren't even looked to really to try and help us through COVID. It just no no one's no one no one thought at any point. Well, let's try and use the it's called the joint ministerial committee. Let's try and use that because there was no way it would be the right thing to use. So at the start, there was a lot of use of COBRA, obviously, when the kind of, you know, a very intense joint working, and that worked really well. But, you know, what that, what hasn't happened throughout the period is a sort of regular regular forum for the four governments to come together routinely and discuss all these things, really, which, you know, is obviously, you know, a, at the very least a missed opportunity, but tells you something pretty fundamental about how far there is to go, really, um, to fix this problem. Mm, yeah definitely um and just going back on the poll you know that this weekend that we mentioned you know 31 yeah. of welsh voters want an independence referendum within the next two years now and um which is a big chunk of the electorate and 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 you know are there i mean and you're facing an election this year so are there sort of specific plans in place on how you're going to tackle that um and sort of make clear that you know uh, a party beyond being just a unionist party, obviously, and sort of differentiating that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think the poll is thirty one percent for a referendum in the next five years. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. So, yeah. so, so our, our task is to say to people in Wales that it isn't a straight choice between what we've got now and uh, independence. Obviously, not all the people who want a referendum say they'll vote for independence in that context. Clearly, so. Um, uh, so that's our 
our task really and you know the challenge for the for for Labour Party in Wales um is to be leading on that debate really and I think we can be because I think you know we've got a good story to tell about the kind of reform that we want to put in place but and we are absolutely clear that we are not defending the status quo there's no case for defending the status quo you know we want radical reform in Wales um the only you know it's not the case that the only radical reform is independence um, you know, we, you know, there's an exciting vision, sort of vision we can articulate as well, really. And actually, part of the issue for us is this: you know, there's a sort of, there's a sort of um, way in which the argument about an independent Wales is slightly idealised, really. It's not properly scrutinised. And what we need to make sure is that all the options which Wales might face in the future are scrutinised in the same way. You know, so. We just spent the last five years trying to decouple ourselves from a 40 year old relationship and it's been hugely traumatic you know the worst of it is yet to be felt and it'll be felt most badly by those people least able to carry the burden as it always is so you know that has been bad enough so we cannot pretend that trying to extricate Wales from a 600 year old relationship is going to be easy it's not going to be easy it's going to involve difficult choices just like being part of an unreformed union involves difficult choices but that isn't you know that the debate isn't had in that way um you know and it needs to be so people have a kind of you know a right to kind of scrutinize those different different options different different visions for the future really yeah i'm going to bring in some questions from some of the people watching so we've got one which you know i think is quite uh, relevant because you mentioned this um this conversation needs to happen needs to move quite quickly so uh, robert's asking how do we achieve any reform towards a federal union before scotland decides to leave well uh, that's i think the 64 million dollar question frankly um you know that the uh, uh, i i gave a talk last week where i was saying you know it's absolutely essential for us as a party both to come forward with the most radical offer we can and to win the next general election to deliver it. Because I think if that doesn't happen, then I think what, we'll, what we're seeing in Scotland is likely to, you know, run much faster than we are able to um, respond to it really. So I, I, you know, I want to make sure that you know, Wales plays its full part, obviously, in, in Keir's um, constitutional convention across the UK. Um, we've done a lot of creative thinking for an awful long time on this and we're in government in Wales um, and we are ready to absolutely play our full part to help shape that and I hope get to a point next year where we have a really radical offer um, and we you know we will want to make that really uh, you know in a, in a very articulate way to people in Scotland and hope we can persuade people that there is a vision of the union which you know is better than the alternative. Yeah, and, and how would that, I mean, so the Welsh Government and Welsh Labour engaging with the Commission, what's the sort of mechanism there for them, like how would that work, um, do you know? I don't, I mean, that's all being sort of worked through at the moment really, but obviously it's a party commission rather than a, a government commission, so it would be, you know, the Welsh Labour Party contributing in the way that other parts of the Labour Party across the UK will do that, really. Um, but as I say, you know, the devolution is not a sort of one-size-fits-all situation in Wales or in Scotland and Northern Ireland and very you know they, they are different things in different parts of the UK um, but that is good because there's a range of different experiences which we can feed into that um, uh, commission the key issue will be how do we persuade you know, the case it seems to me if you're a, um, a Labour voter who's worried about um, you know elect, whether we can elect a Labour government in Westminster and is sort of thinking about voting for independence because that may feel like a way of getting Labour governments in Wales into the future. If you're that person in Wales or that person in Scotland, uh, you know, the task is to make to give you that kind of confidence that there's a different you know, way of doing it, really. And it's not a small task, but those people, I think, we will lose their support if we aren't able to commit to them that we are serious about reform and that we can deliver it. I think that's the task we face. And, and I agree there isn't that much time for doing that, really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a few questions sent in as well from our readers. So one's um, one's asked because you you're obviously been put in charge in, of um, Wales's recovery from COVID because you don't have enough to do uh, already. So um, and he's asked what will La Welsh Labour's COVID recovery plan and economic rebuild look like, um, and how will it differ from the approach taken by the UK government? 
Well, actually, my work on that has actually come to an end. I published a report in October. So um, for, 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 for a detailed response, you can check out um, the Welsh Government website, which has a report which describes what we're going to do. But we approach the task really with um, three principles in mind. Uh, one was economic justice, one is environmental justice, and one is social justice. And the things that we, you know, keep key learnings i guess from the work that we have done is obviously the potentially disproportionate impact on young people of the economic burden of covid both from unemployment in the short term and the fiscal impact in the long term which could be very significant indeed so we've already brought forward a package of support uh, to encourage people to stay on in education which we think is you know probably the biggest um, support we can offer in the short term but also brought forward um, support to encourage employers to hire um, young people on apprenticeships, so some very specific things around that. Um, also coming out of it was a very, very strong commitment to um, a green recovery. You know, it's easy to say that, isn't it, really? But a number of the kind of policies that we've um, come forward with is around um, uh, construction of uh, low carbon homes, uh, re um, energy retrofitting, um, significant investment in renewables, some very exciting things about uh, renewable energy in our hospital estate and so on some investment in hydrogen so some quite specific things about kind of different kind of economic picture into the future and i guess from a kind of values point of view what we would say as a government is we've been absolutely determined to put at the heart of uh, the covid recovery those people who've been most disproportionately um you know adversely affected by it so you know we are very keen, keen to make sure um, you know women and young people in particular in the labor market are in sectors that are in lockdown. Uh, members of the BME communities have had a particular both um, health impact but also economic impact. So we've got very specific kind of policies to address people who've particularly carried um, some of the heavy burden during COVID, really. Yeah, yeah. And uh, another question we've had from our readers is more about the uh, just the practicalities, really, of the campaign coming up because obviously everything's happening in the new socially distanced uh, remote kind of world for the moment so what's going to be you know what's going to be the changes in how you're going to campaign in this um election how are you going to reach out to people because normally we would door knock all the time that's a big labor um sort of uh way of do, doing things and that's a massive weapon in our arsenal in a campaign yeah. Yeah. so what, what are we going to do now uh with covid well you know there's two i, I guess two or three of uh, the more obvious end and a couple of other slightly more kind of unusual things really so I guess you know doing as much online work as possible. Obviously, you're not reaching your whole electorate, but you're reaching quite significant uh, proportion. So all of us are trying to find different ways of engaging through local constituency networks. I'm doing myself. Um, you know, I have quite a strong network with third sector organisations, for example. Um, so doing a lot of work in that space, trying to do as much as I can with young people, both through school networks and uh, others. So some of that is about on you know being as visible as possible online. I think mm. the, the the other obvious aspect is um, around kind of telephone, um, telephone canvassing and phone banking. You know, that's, you know, obviously a bit of a challenge. Really. Not everyone is up for doing that. And I think at the moment, people are particularly um, anxious about doing that, I think, because, you know, um, because of COVID, really, you know. So, but I think it'd be really key for us to, make, to be able to mobilise um people in that way. I think the way of having those conversations at this point, uh, given where we are in terms of the, you know, the, the kind of COVID pressures still being with us and still living with that, I think the kind of conversations people um, want to be having is around, you know, how, how, how do you feel about what's going on around you? How can we support you? What are the issues on your mind? It's those kinds of you know, discussions and conversations rather than, um, you know, the kind of polling data driven um, kind of conversations, I think, are the kind of powerful ones. And I think equally, we are also in ways looking at, as I said earlier, a new cohort of first time voters who are 16 uh, and 17. So obviously, we've not in the past had any experience of engaging in an election context with voters of that age. My kind of take on that has been for a long time, really, that we can't just um, uh, approach that relationship by as one of kind of persuading 16 and 17 year olds just to vote Labour. I think there needs to be a much more kind of rounded set of conversations. And I think it's about helping, help, you know, asking 16 and 17 year olds to help us find the solutions to some of the challenges, which we've not obviously been very great at fixing because they're going to be carrying the burden of them 
for much longer than anybody else by definition, really. So I think it's developing that kind of way of relating and that way of having those discussions with younger voters, which isn't, again, isn't about the data collection. It's about mm. you know, deep engagement in how do we solve some of these challenges together, really. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much for your time tonight, um, Jeremy. And thank you, everyone, for watching and, and, and watching along this evening. And thank you for your questions. So um, that's it for tonight. And, and thank you very much. Thank you. Good night.